We are living in the midst of an artisanal renaissance. From food to fashion to mixology and beyond, a new emphasis on the old ways of doing things. Modern day artisans use certain techniques to achieve that ever elusive goal, quality. Being true to your roots, procuring the best ingredients in the world, adapting time honored methods. These steps allow you to get the highest quality product possible. Makes sense. But in an age when technology on farms and factories and even in the home are more advanced than ever, why do it the hard way? The answer seems simple, but it's really hard to pin down. I'm Tony Abuganum, master mixologist with over 30 years of experience under my belt. I've won Iron Chef, mixed drinks for some of the most discerning crowds in New York, San Francisco, and Las Vegas, and helped shape the cocktail mixology movement happening today through my book, The Modern Mixologist. I know what quality means when making a cocktail, but there's more to the story a bigger movement happening right now. Maybe some of the modern day artisans, the participants of this movement, will be able to explain it a little bit better. Bombay Sapphire asked me to travel around to ask some luminaries of the new artisanal movement what quality means to them and their work. First stop, New York City, where I met the designers of Barking Irons, a folklore-inspired clothing line, and ask them what role history plays in their designs. Whatever the detail may be, we try to incorporate it into a modern garment, but it gives that element of storytelling and a little bit of history. Next stop, Tuscany, where boutique perfume makers David and Kavi of DS and Durga joined me to scour the hills in search of the perfect wild botanicals. Aromatically, when a plant is wild, the chemical compounds might be more varied and, and you get more interesting complexities. Then, off to England, where I met Katrina Markov, world-renowned chocolatier and owner of the Chicago-based Vosges au Chocolat. Process is something that is extremely complex and can really radically change the end result from one confectioner to the next. She and I toured the Bombay Sapphire Distillery to learn about the role of process in creating quality. I ended my tour in Las Vegas at a bartender summit to experience quality in action. I saw how my colleagues incorporate high quality artisanal spirits and mixers into their cocktails. Maybe they'll even teach me a thing or two. In order to create something of high quality, you have to know the story behind it. I went to New York City to meet with the Casarella brothers, who designed clothing based on 1900s folklore from right here in Lower Manhattan. Their inspiration? The legendary gang wars of the Five Points, the subject of Scorsese's Gangs of New York. My name is Michael Casarella. I'm one of the owners of Barking Irons. My name is Daniel Casarella, and I am founder and co-owner of Barking Irons. Our clothing uses history and folklore to tell stories in a medium that's relevant and expressive today. Originally what I did was I, I set out to do t-shirts, but try to imbue them with stuff that I was reading at the time, which happened to be history books. I was fascinated by history. And the, the further down the line we went, the more you know, out of the shadows that the brand idea came. What you find in oral history and the things that get passed down from generation to generation is a little bit more colorful and nuanced than what you'll find in the book. At first it just started with like old vernacular, you know, gang names, and then it became, well, why don't, we, why don't we celebrate more folk history and Americana? We try to find these stories and we try to do justice and honor to them and bring them back in a way that's relevant to a modern person. We met at an old Prohibition era speakeasy in the Lower East Side, once owned by the notorious gangster Meyer Lansky. It's a place where New York City history is very much still alive. Welcome. Hey, how are you? Michael Casarella. Hey, Michael, Tony Abugano. This is my brother Daniel. Hey, Hi, Tony. Daniel. Hey, Daniel. How nice you doing? To meet you. Welcome to New York. No surprise, gin proved to be the perfect icebreaker for a frank discussion. It's a common misconception that the English created gin, when actually it was the Dutch that first mixed neutral spirit with juniper. Really? And then later, as the English fought side by side with the Dutch, they noticed that the Dutch soldiers had a little bit of this gin that they would sip before they went into battle. Well, that's the uh, Dutch courage story. Exactly, the yeah. Dutch courage. So it didn't take long for the English soldiers to embrace Dutch courage. And when they returned to England, they brought gin with them. With a little more fight in them. <laughs> exactly. I have to tell you, that is a beautiful shirt. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Is that one of yours? Um, this is not one of ours. Oh. But, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's similar to what we do. It's, it's a kind of a heritage, rough-hewn-based 
um, you know, type garment, something that looks like it's been worn, used, um, not in a, not necessarily in a polite society, but in more of a, in a country rustic era. Well, one of the things that caught my eye was that cool bartending shirt that you offer. Right. Oh, right, the dolman sleeve. Which is a 19th century detail of shirting where the shoulder uh, seam, as you can see on most shirts, falls on the shoulder, but the shoulder seam on the dolman sleeve falls here on the mid-arm. And in the 19th century, it was something that gave store clerks, bartenders, anybody who was involved in a lot of movement, it gave them more uh, flexibility. This is, this is before, like, the, you know, like, knitwear was widely available, you know, stretching uh, fabrics. Um, so the weaves, you know, were tight. They're more like woven shirts. And you'd have to create different inventions in the pattern just to allow for certain movements so they wouldn't rip. You know, when you have this cultured history mm -hmm. as part of your uh, identity, you know, you really shouldn't leave that behind. You should celebrate it. So what you're showing us now is the original recipe of the martini? Well, the original recipe is, is really, there's so much lore surrounding the martini. Right. The perfect dry martini that we know today, I think was possibly first made for Rockefeller in 1911 at the Knickerbocker Hotel by a bartender by the name of Martini, who used London dry gin and French dry vermouth, almost in 50-50 portions. And not having a name, they just named it after the creator, the bartender, whose name was Martini. It's rare to get a good martini like this. And it's, it's like you, the, the passion and the quality you put into your clothing, it's the same with putting into a great cocktail and great martini, with, beginning with the glass and the quality of the glass, the ice I used, the preparation, you notice I, I stirred it, I didn't shake it. Which is, that's, that's a big misconception, right? I guess that comes from uh, certain secret agents. Yeah, but in popular culture, I mean, that's how we've all been taught to make martinis. That's, that's true, and my rule is if the drink contains spirit only, like the classic dry martini, it should always be chilled by stirring. But if it contains juice or egg or cream, you always want to really shake it vigorously to wake it up, as Harry Craddock once said. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that, that certain British agent also kind of threw a wrench into the perfect dry martini by ordering it with vodka. Hmm. I mean, vodka is great, but it, it's not a martini. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful gin, vermouth. It really impacted, I think, our uh, understanding and appreciation of not only the preparation, but of how the perfect dry martini should be crafted. Absolutely. And that's what we're all about. We love the way that history gets misinterpreted over time, sometimes working out for the worse, sometimes working out for the better. But it makes a good story. Here's mm -hmm. to setting the record straight. Cheers. Cheers. Knowing your craft's heritage, where you fit into a greater tradition, is important in making a high-end artisanal product. But there's more to it than that. There's the actual ingredients that go into the products themselves. I met up with David and Kavi of DS and Durga Perfumes, a small batch boutique perfumery that operates out of Gowanus, Brooklyn. They're experts in sourcing the highest quality botanicals from around the world for each of their signature scents. We're Diaz and Durga. We make handmade small batch fragrances, and we're here today in our lab in Gowanus, Brooklyn. This is where we make 100% of our product. David's task is very specialized, and he's the nose and makes the perfume, and my side of it is more of the design. So anything that's like aesthetic or design packaging, that's what I do. These are flower extracts. There's spices, there's herbs, there's woods. You know, we, we keep a lot of these old old books around here. You know, there's a lot of old recipes in, in these books that definitely inform what we do. Every scent that we create, we have a story behind. And so it, it, it's sort of like an abstract thing in your mind that you would put into a song or a poem that would make sense. It's the same thing with, with, a, with a scent, you know, being able to use the different notes. We like that every product that we make, every bottle that comes out of our lab is has been touched by our two hands and and only us. It's a really good way to maintain quality control and make sure everything is up to our standards. David and Kavi were actually honeymooning in Italy while I was there, and they agreed to accompany me on a trek through the Tuscan hills. We met with Ivan, master of botanicals for Bombay Sapphire Gin, 
who personally travels the world seeking out the finest ingredients for Bombay Sapphire. He guided us to the wild juniper groves of Tuscany, where the berries are still gathered by hand. Now, do you harvest the juniper here, or is it? No, our, uh, the juniper is, is wild. It grows uh, wild? Yeah, grows wild. Juniper is a very strong uh, uh, bush, so it's, it's uh, robust. Yeah, they said it was one of the first plants to come after the Ice Age, actually. It's just such an ancient plant. It's a very strong plant that is able to, to grow in a, in a very wild area. Doesn't need fertilizer, doesn't need chemicals. Has it passed down through like generations? Yeah, normally it's people a long, long time ago that do this kind of this kind of job. So they, they work eight hour doing this uh, this job. So you can imagine that the under the sun or maybe in, in November, even when it's cold, is a very hard job to 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 do. Okay, let me introduce Rita and Lionello. Now we are we can ask them some questions. So I'm just curious, how long have you been? Uh, collecting uh, the juniper berries. 50. Yes, 50 years. 40 more than 40 years. Wow. Leonardo is doing this kind of, this kind of job. So he's, he's 70 years old. So you see the juniper takes younger. <laughs> so, it can be. so much just goes into the final product, you know? That's, you see. That's what is important to say sometimes. So to, to remember the people that what is in a nice bottle, is also the job of the people, yeah, the passion the, of the The background people. is so important, and, and for our perfume as well, the stories are so important, and it really, you know, makes for a more interesting product. So, Tony, now you have a couple of faces in front of you that when you mix a gin, Bombay, I can realize. No, I absolutely, I, I didn't realize that there was so much beautiful love and passion that is going into collecting the juniper berries that one day end up in your gin and one day in my Negroni, so. She said, if you want to uh, keep, keep her with you. <laughs> the juniper fields were gorgeous. To celebrate the experience, I decided to make my friends a drink that originated here in Italy. It's a classic with complex flavors, one of my favorites. The Negroni, which was invented here and named for Count Negroni in 1919. It's usually served over ice, but I prefer mine straight up. And there you have Thank you. a Negroni by Tony. Cheers, Cheers to a wonderful to Tony day. Negroni. To a great day. Happiness. There are 10 botanicals in Bombay Sapphire Gin, including juniper, angelica, cassia bark, lemon peel, and cubeb berries, sourced from all over the world. The balance between all of these botanicals is key to making such a high quality spirit. David and Kavi agree that using the very best natural ingredients are as essential to creating Dias and Durga's scents as they are to making Bombay Sapphire. How are your Negronis? Amazing. They're delicious. Yeah. Thank you for making Cheers. them. Cheers. Here's to a uh, absolutely beautiful day. Great. Uh, I put the cubab berries oh, yeah. in a pepper mill. And yeah, Cuba is great. But it's pretty amazing when you have a well-made spirit that you can kind of break it down and actually detect the different botanicals and different yeah. flavor components. Yeah. Well, how does taste work into some of your choices in making perfumes? For taste, 40% um, of taste is smell. So I, there's definitely a, a link between taste and smell anyway. Certainly the botanicals that are used in, in cooking can have applications within perfume, you know? I mean, this basil, we definitely use basil. Could use cubab, you know? Rosemary. For sure, rosemary, there's a lavender here. Mm -hmm. We use angelica, the coriander, licorice, you know? These are, these are all things that can be used in food, but are also, um, you know, notes used in perfumery and colognes. A knowledge of history and access to the finest ingredients are two essentials for any modern day artisan. But by themselves, they don't exactly yield anything. The process is what brings it all together. Steps taken with such care that they produce one-of-a-kind masterpieces. So, I went to England to witness the process of making Bombay Sapphire Gin for myself. Accompanying me, chocolatier extraordinaire, Katrina Markov. 
I'm Katrina Markov, and I started this company called Vosges Chocolat almost 12 years ago. And on the premise of really traveling the world through chocolate and using chocolate as a medium to tell stories, you can have something beautiful without having the quality be beautiful. So you always have to start with the finest ingredients, and every cook knows that. This is grains of paradise, which we toast to bring out the oils, which is also used in gin. Sweet Hungarian paprika bacon that we've cooked that we use in our bacon bar, both the dark chocolate and the milk chocolate bacon bar. And a constant evolution looking for better things. So, you know, some people like to say this is the original recipe and it's never changed and that's great. You know, nothing is really totally holy for me. It's all about innovation and bettering things, pushing yourself and pushing the product. We use a Kumamoto oyster and this is the cold infusion for seven days. And then we strain out all the oysters, and then we just heat up the cream and add it to white chocolate with some champagne, and we make a truffle. But my main focus here at Vosges is really sort of driving the innovation and the creativity and the, the vision, and really pushing boundaries and breaking boxes of what a chocolate company is to some people, and really pushing the lifestyle elements and just creating, creating, creating. This is the most important thing for me, and it's what makes me the happiest. If anyone knows about melding high-end natural ingredients into something truly luxurious, it's Katrina. Her artisanal chocolates are considered the top tier of sweets, and they owe it all to brilliantly balanced ingredients and painstakingly precise processes. In London, I introduced her to my friend David Clunton, a professor of gin and distillation. There aren't too many people with this particular PhD. We met at the Blue Room in London to talk before taking a tour of the Sapphire Distillery in Warrington. We started our talk with a refreshing Sapphire Collins. And as always, we want to start with the freshest possible juice. And we're going to, very simple recipe as most drinks are. A little swizzle. Here's to you. Cheers. David, Katrina. Good health. So I thought it'd be fun to get you two together. David has a PhD in gin flavor. It's now, how do you get a PhD in gin? <laughs> well, I've asked myself that question many times. I became a chemist and then I just uh, moved into the wine and spirit industry not knowing really where I was going and then had the opportunity to do a PhD on gin, which I thought was a, a cracking thing to do. I wrote a thesis on uh, the flavorings of gin, which no one really knew much about at that time. David, Katrina is one of the finest chocolate makers in America. Oh, she has okay. a company called Vosges au Chocolat in Vosges. Chicago. Yes. That's French, isn't it? Yeah, it's a French name. Uh, Where's that? Like Alsace, is it? Yeah, yeah. it's from Northern Alsace, France. the name, but um, really inspired by the square in Paris, Place de Vosges, which is where I went to school at the oh. Monopoly. I do chocolate with really interesting ingredients from like bacon to curry to olive oil. David had a lot to teach us about the role process has in defining the quality of a gin. You know, you can make a uh, really basic gin from uh, alcohol to which you add flavorings, which you isolate by other distillation techniques, or what you might call bathtub gin, really basic quality stuff. Uh, and then you move on to distilled gin, where you take your, uh, your botanicals and your herbs. Uh, you may add some flavorings to that as well, and then you distill that. And thirdly, there's a sort of premium end, which is uh, London dry gin. Uh, now, London dry gin nowadays really reflects more the process of manufacture. So there are certain restraints in what you can do uh, in terms of the purity of the alcohol you use. You always have to use original botanical materials, which you then actually distill with your alcohol, uh, and you can produce this super premium product called London dry gin. Uh, similar to the art of distillation, I'm kind of yeah. interested to know the, the process of making chocolate. Fermentation is really, really critical mm -hmm. to the process of cacao beans. And, you know, more um, larger companies won't even ferment at all. It's more the artisanal companies will say, no, I want my fermentation to be, you know, anywhere from three to nine days. But the process is a bit similar to distillation and then the final product, um, creating it with infusions of different spices, um, is what we do to create the confection at the end. Well, that's an interesting comparison because in Bombay Sapphire is quite a unique uh, distillation process, mm -hmm. uh, vapor infusion. Yeah. But maybe you could talk a little bit about that. In fact, actually, sapphire is, um, in fact, quite unique uh, in that it uses uh, a process called vapor infusion, uh, whereby the alcohol vapors pass from the still through a basket, uh, a perforated basket, which contains the botanicals. It's a much gentler uh, and softer process, and it gives you uh, quite a, um, a unique 
um, and more, a more sort of delicate uh, London dry gin. So the entire process of making Bombay Sapphire happens right here. Yeah, this is the nerve center of the operation here. Uh, and um, here we see the cart head stills here. You see they're made from copper with the rectifying column up there, which helps to purify the alcohol even more. The vapors pass up through the column and across there, uh, the line arm and through the baskets, which are on the mezzanine floor. But why don't we go up and have a look at the stills? Great. So David, Bombay Sapphire exclusively utilizes copper pot stills? Yes, it does. In fact, they're, uh, they're used traditionally in the industry to produce many spirits. You can bend and shape copper into any shape you like. You see the onion pot still here. Okay, guys, well, this is the heart of the process. These are uh, actually the perforated copper baskets that are used in the chamber, which is the, uh, the heart of the vapour infusion process. We weigh each of the botanicals out to a specific recipe that's been developed over a very long period of time. Uh, next is the, the lemon peel. The lemon peels, so okay. It is in ribbon form. Ribbons, yeah. We just literally just put it in by hand. And those lemons are all peeled by hand as well. They are. Correct? They are, yes. Are they and really? dried, yes, they are peeled by hand. And they're from dry. what origin? That's from Spain. From Spain. Yes. Once the baskets are uh, filled with the botanicals, they go into the botanicals chamber and they are ready to, to start the distillation. And that's the vapor infusion? That's the vapor infusion process, yeah. The, the vapor comes up, upwards through the, through the perforated baskets, so it takes out the flavor very gradually and gently and evenly. And so after the uh, alcohol vapor comes through the condenser, it, it turns back into liquid, and that liquid comes through the spirit safe, which is where we can sample the liquid, make sure it's of, uh, of good quality, and check the strength, etc. Why don't we go and have a look at that yeah, next? That's it. Well, here we are. This is the last part of the process here. And this is what we call the spirit safe. And this is where the uh, vapor from the line arm runs through the condenser and is turned back into liquid. So we now know how Bombay Sapphire gets in the bottle. Yeah. I think it's time to put it in the glass. My passion is to share what I know about the storied legacy of cocktail culture with some of the new faces pushing the boundaries of mixology today. It was finally time to come home to Las Vegas, where I attended a bartender summit, an annual event that gathers some of the top mixologists in America under one roof. This was a perfect place to see top shelf quality ingredients in action, and I had the pleasure of meeting with two of the summit semifinalists. Andrew is a bartender in New York, known for his innovative cocktails. And then, so I have that base, and then I'm going to use egg white for consistency and to give it a head. Kristen, a bartender in Las Vegas, believes in using only the freshest ingredients in her cocktails and hopes to inspire other women to join the artisanal movement in mixology. The cocktail that I'm doing for you is called the Don Harlow. It is named after my Uncle Don. He lived in Harlow, Essex, three quarters ounce of lemon juice, gentlemen. So I'm going to vigorously shake this. Tell me a little bit more about how you got started. I just got back into bartending after eight years of being in the kitchen. But I decided that, you know, I got to a point in my culinary career that I really wanted to get back into the front of the house and talk to people and talk to the customers and, you know, interact. That's really what kind of drove me to be like, okay, let's go back out to the bar and challenge myself in a different way using very different ingredients. So let's talk a little bit about modern day mixology. For me, I even I think the last five years, American mixology has completely changed its face. Most cocktails are only based on four ingredients. Any cocktail is a variation of something else. So, but it's amazing how everybody's like chefs and just create so many different options for bartenders. And more and more homes have cocktail sets. They have the shakers, the spoons, the jiggers, the muddlers. And I don't think 10 years ago that would be the same story because uh, artisanal cocktail has become a very trendy thing to, to drink. You know, it's not just wine and beer. It's everyone, people really now want to taste these fresh, seasonal, creative cocktails. It's part of, you know, going out now at night, on the night on the town, it's part of it. Uh, and I think taking those classic recipes and just building on them uh, with seasonal, fresh ingredients 
It's easy, it's fun, it's delicious. As long as the cocktail is made correctly and it's not over poured, simple to complex, every drop is gold. The funny thing I find that was, I think it's great, is that just like in culinary, the whole mixology scene, everyone's taking a step back and they're looking at pre-prohibition. Because it's true, you need to have a foundation for education. And the guys who started it, you need to respect them. And that's, you know, you start from the beginning and then you progress yourself from there. I'm so excited for tonight. The United States Bartenders Guild Summit Finals this evening, and I've got the great privilege of being one of the final judges. So I wish you both the best of luck. Have fun tonight. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. And thanks for being part of my journey. It came as no surprise to me that both Andrew and Kristen were selected as two of the top 10 finalists in the last night of the summit. Now, are you incorporating the same flavors into your cocktail as exactly. you did with the garnish? Yeah, yeah. There's chartreuse, there's ginger syrup, fresh pineapple juice. This is curfew of lime leaf bitters. Rosemary and the basil. A cold infusion? Yeah, uh, heat. Actually. Okay. And then reduced uh, to room temp. That's beautiful. Well, best of luck. Yeah, nice to see so. you. Good to see you again. Cheers. Beautiful. Cheers. Happiness. Cheers. Happiness. Cheers. I want to welcome you all to tonight's USBG Bartender Summit. Let's hear it for Ms. Kristen Schaefer. We are going to start with three quarters ounce of fresh lemon juice. Andrew Murabito, all the way from New York City. Let's give him a big welcome. First, I am going to do six pieces of cucumber. Start off by muddling red bell pepper. This is an Earl Grey tea, a white Earl Grey tea infused simple syrup. And this is blue agave nectar. I use opal basil. I grew it in my hotel room. Texas tarragon here. Bubble it up. Release those oils in the basil. A little swizzle action. The shake. Let's hear it for the shake. There we go. Come on, everybody. And there you have it. The sapphire of emerald fizz. It's the Don Harlow. All right, let's hear it for Kristen. The acidity was perfect, and the spuma was really, really a nice compliment. Using the teacup was a brilliant idea. Let's hear it for all our finalists. High quality products, crafted with care, steeped in history. These markers have come to define the new artisanal renaissance. We've just seen it in action. From the importance of knowing your place in history, to using the right ingredients, to putting it all together just right. It's happening in your neighborhood and in mine. People care about the things they're consuming and they are reacting to the love and dedication, the hard work, and the high level of quality that artisans employ. Now that deserves a toast. And have an amazing night. Cheers. Woo!